Yep. Um, well, first of all, I'm a PhD student at Virginia Tech. Um, and I'm really focusing on how community development techniques and tools can help us uh, assist farm or kind of facilitate grower innovation for agroforestry products. And so if you all will uh, humor me for one second and uh, take one moment to stand up with me and we can pretend to be trees just like the people on the screen. And for now we're just trees. <laughs> and now we're trees in the wind. Any other ideas? We don't, probably don't want to be broken in half trees, <laughs> but we could. <laughs> broken in half trees <laughs> and trees in the wind again. We grew back. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much. <laughs> There's not a lot of stretching at these agroforestry <laughs> conferences. I might lobby for some yoga sessions. Um, so I changed my title a little bit from in the uh, abstracts, and that's just because since I submitted the abstract, I had have been developing the research further along. So I've really only changed one word. I switched community organizing to community development. So don't get too confused when you're reading the abstract. Um, and so today, an outline of the talk, I'm really mostly going to be providing a justification for why we should consider community development in terms of assisting our, or facilitating grower innovation for agroforestry products. And then I'll talk a little bit about my research plan thus far, but it's really you know, still in development. So um, yep. most of the talk is really going to be talking, talking through why community, community development. And so agroforestry has a very strong scientific backing here. You know, it's very high, but we still see low, low adoption relatively. Um, and when we look at permaculture, which is a grassroots movement um, to mimic natural systems and the design of human systems, we see that the rela relationship is kind of inverse. Uh, permaculture lacks a scientific ba basis, but it actually has a, c a considerable amount of adoption. And so that leads to the question, what can agroforestry learn from permaculture? And ultimately, it can go the other way around too, right? What can permaculture learn from agroforestry? But for today, I'm just going to be kind of pulling key lessons from permaculture that we can apply to our field. And so in order to kind of answer that question, it's important to make some distinctions between the two. And ultimately, this is going to be like probably part of an hour-long discussion this afternoon. Um, but just to make some simple distinctions, mo most of the time, agroforestry is considered kind of a science and a practice. And then permaculture um, is more of a, a design process, a practice, and then kind of different. It's, it's also a social movement and a worldview. And this is Rafter's research here that I'm referencing. Um, but all of these differences have, we could go, go into discussions on each of those. But really what I'm interested in for my research is the difference in, in terms of permaculture as a social network and what we can learn from that. And so social networks are really informal webs Hi. of connections between individuals or organizations. And there's loads of stuff about social networks. And even in agroforestry, they've been found um, to, to play a critical role in, our, in the adoption and retention of agroforestry systems. Um, and that's primarily because they enhance the exchange of complex agrarian information. When, pe when people are more connected and when various groups are connected to one another, there's better exchange of this complex information. Um, and it can also affect economic performance. So there's a really good, uh, there's a better chance if you're in an enterprise, if you know more people, that you're going to be able to successfully market your products. And if you have a stronger social network, there's also a really good chance that you're going to be able to work with people more easily and find people that you can go into enterprise with. And ultimately, social networks are really thought about in, in social science as infrastructure um, for basically taking collective action. And they also influence that collective action. And collective action really straightforward is basically when people work together um, within these social, social networks to leverage resources that may not be available to one individual, but when you work together, you are able to, to leverage more resources. And so collective action has been found to increase the development of innovative solutions. That makes sense too. That's pretty straightforward. You know, when you're working with more people with diverse backgrounds, diverse ideas, there's a better chance that you're going to come up with a better innovative solution to marketing complex lesser known products that are often in many of our agroforestry systems. And innovation generally is the application of new ideas and that's key to, to adoption and retention of agroforestry systems. And so when you bring the two together, social networks, which is really that infrastructure, 
and collective action, which is that activity taken within that infrastructure, um, it leads to two key components of community, community development, which is kind of why I've started to focus more on community, community development, um, because it's this key, tangible, actionable item that we can study and interact with, with agroforestry. And community development is a planned process, basically where people come together and act on solutions and uh, take action towards solving pro common problems. And in terms of the word community, there are lots of definitions of community, but for the purposes of this research, it's just really a system of individuals uh, working together to solve problems and meet their needs. And there are many different types of community. Uh, there's one author who lists out maybe eight different types of community, but for simplicity's sake, I'm going with um, Green and Haynes, which is actually not cited on here, but they just make the distinction simply between communities of interest and communities of practice. And communities of interest are really groups of people that come together around a shared interest, and communities of place are more bound by geographic location. And so we have a kind of an interplay between communities of interest and communities of place when, we come, when we're talking about agroforestry. And um, ultimately, it's probably going to be a fuzzy distinction no matter what, but I kind of see um, communities of interest having a number of people not bound by geographic space, but I also see, I'm starting to see that there's this place for communities of place within that larger community of interest. Um, and so kind of following that train of thought from, from permaculture as a social network and then looking at collective action and how that both, the, both of those components lead to community development, we kind of see this key lesson we can learn from permaculture that may help us increase adoption of agroforestry. And so instead of waiting for more low-hanging fruit to grow, we can innovate too. And as agroforesters, we may be able to look to community development as a new way to reach uh, new audiences. And that may require us to develop more skill sets um, in community development, but I know that uh, it's maybe not applicable in every circumstance, and really, in many cases, it may just be, be, be um, edit a researcher kind of engaging with somebody who has that skill set and just acknowledging that this is maybe something we need to consider when we're pulling together interdisciplinary teams. But I know a number of agroforesters have probably already found themselves having to develop this skill set um, when they're working with growers. And so being able to get some key lessons from community, community development uh, in application to agroforestry, um, we really need to understand more of that connection. And ultimately, in North America, kind of in the past 30 years, these two things have been uh, more separate. So research and development, you know, the research paths and have, have been a little bit separate. But when you look into the international agroforestry, these two fields really start to fissure together more. Um, and so there's a lot of knowledge we can apply from international, international agroforestry to North American agroforestry. And in doing that, it's also cri critical to choose a research approach that can handle the complexities of these two fields kind of merging together. And that's where I've kind of found action research to be um, something that I think could be pretty applicable in helping us understand how to better employ um, community development in, our, in, our, in the US. And action research is a participatory process. Um, it aims to inform meaningful action in a community. And ultimately, it's conducting research with the community. So throughout the research process, you know, when you're, ask, you're developing a question, a plan, instruments, interpretation, and dissemination, the community can be involved to different extents throughout that entire process. So it's a little bit different than, you know, citizen science, because most of the time citizen science is already, a researcher has set up this experiment, and then they invite the community to participate with them. But action research is more the community involved from, from the very beginning, um, and to the extent that they would like to be. And so, a lot of the times in standard research, the literature is our compass for, you know, seeing what's happened and filling a gap. But in action research, adding to the literature, it's really um, including the community. In, in, the, in kind of guiding where we go with the research. And so these approaches can really be seen as a tool to help us understand more complexities of these social systems. And um, there, again, there's been research, Rachelou in 1991, she's been, she publishes in agroforestry, and um, it is more in an international uh, context 
but she's kind of you know saying these participatory approaches can really be important tools for us as agroforesters. And so that led me to my research question, which you know it's always changing. Maybe it'll change in a week, but right now um, I'm really interested in how community development techniques and tools um, can influence agroforestry grower innovation in rural Appalachia. And again, that innovation is really linked to adoption and retention. And so the Hello. folks that um, I'm, I'm working with actually already are primarily growers. Uh, they are current and potential growers and local organizations and also technical service providers. And the place I've been living for the past year um, is uh, Southwest Virginia, Grayson and Carroll counties down here. And it's right on the North Carolina border. It's right, Grayson County is where I actually live in, and the highest mountain in the state is there, Mount Rogers. Um, so it's, it's a gorgeous place. It's very remote and rural. Um, there is a road that kind of goes in between these two counties, but, um, and Carroll County has a little bit more resources. It's closer to the interstate. Grayson County gets pretty, pretty remote, you know. There's one stoplight in the entire county. Well, there are 15,000 people in the entire county. Um, and thus far, I've been, as a part of my fellowship that's funded through a private organization uh. in that community, I've been facilitating a grower network called the Blue Ridge Woodland Growers. And so far, we have a number of people who are interested, you know, it, coming around that community of interest in this community of place, um, people who are interested in non-timber forest products and really being able to build some economic enterprise out of them in a sustainable way. And so a lot of the research is basically, the, re the heart of the research is focused in this region. But in order to see if what we're finding there is relatable to other places and basically in, in order to see how it compares to different groups, we're going to be also zooming out to Appalachia as a whole, and we'll be um, researching and studying kind of other groups that are similar to the Blue Ridge Woodland Growers um, throughout Appalachia. And some community, community development tools that we are looking into right now. Uh, one is the Community Capitals Framework, another is pre Appreciative Inquiry. And, um, we actually have uh, the person who developed this framework here in the room here, Dr. Flora, but um, so basically community capitals are a way to, um, are kind of a tool you can use in community development to help uh, break down the different resources available to a community. So it's based on the assumption that every community, um, no matter how impoverished or, or how, how the lack of financial capital they have, there's still resources they can draw upon. And so there are these different types, you know, like human capital would be education and skills that are, reside within an individual. Um, social capital are relationships and the resources that can be leveraged through those relationships. Political capital is, you know, the access an individual has to decision making in, an, in a community or in a group. Um, cultural capital is basically a way of knowing, you know, what, what, how do people know what is? And um, natural capital is pretty straightforward. You know, that's the natural resource base that everything really depends upon and that we, we all here are, are seeing that link and that's a lot, a lot of the times what draws us into this work. Um, and built capital are, are, is the infrastructure involved. Um, involved, you know, like it can be roads, uh, power lines, but in our case, a lot of times it's like gr harvesting equipment or processing equipment. Um, so again, that's a way of identifying resources, but appreciative inquiry is an assets-based approach of figuring out how to actually leverage and reconfigure those resources for um, improving what is. And it's, um, it has a positive core, which basically means you, it starts with, um, and it's also called the three Ds of appreciative inquiry. It starts with discovery, which is saying, hey, what's, what are we, what are, what's going on that's really good here? And what do we have to build on that's strong, a strong foundation? And then it goes to dream, which is what, what could we do better? And then design is how are, we gonna, how are we gonna get to that point? And destiny is ultimately taking that action to get to that point. So these are kind of two, two different uh, community development approaches that, um, that I'm interested in applying to agroforestry and um, economic development around that. So the methods are not uh, set in stone yet, but I, but I anticipate that they will, they'll be primary, they'll, 
they will be um, social science methods. And in, in the local context, it'll be uh, looking at key informant interviews, surveys with members, um, documentation, document analysis. So basically looking at some of the stuff we've done in the last year and kind of drawing out concepts and themes and being able to track what we've done. And then elic elicitation dialogues, which is this kind of new method that I um, haven't found a lot, of, a lot on, but it's basically a large group methodology similar to a focus group, but there are more people involved. And it's oftentimes um, looks like the format of a, of a workshop, a really interactive workshop where people might be asked to share their opinions and put sticky notes on the wall and things like that. And ultimately you take all of that information and you analyze it and um, uh, synthesize it. And then for the regional aspect, we'll be looking at surveys and key informant interviews with those groups. And some of the outcomes are kind of a community report. So, you know, kind of the foundation of action research, again, is that meaningful, meaningful information feeds back into the community. So that's a key deliverable for this research. And um, so basically pulling together all of this information that the community is sharing, synthesizing it, and packaging it in a way that they can use it and move forward which in terms of kind of, I've been living in this community for a year and there's just so many amazing people, so many things they're doing, but everybody's kind of confused. They don't know where, where everything fits. And so I'm really excited to play that role as a researcher to um, basically draw upon the collective wisdom, but package it in a way that people can use it. And ultimately also, I will be publishing journal articles out of that. And that, that does kind of get to this tension of action research, being able to provide a, um, a meaningful kind of product for the community, but then also being able to finish and uh, defend and publish a dissertation. And so I think a lot of the times, um, so a few journal articles will come out of it and maybe that will be more of the local regional interplay and being able to maybe speak to a larger context, but ultimately share as well um, what's worked well in terms of community development tools. And so just to conclude, there are lessons we can learn from permaculture, you know, kind of that heart, that social network. Um, and then knowledge from community development already, it's a very well established field. There are these tools we can use. Um, and that's, uh, that's been done a lot in, in the context of agroforestry in international settings, so we can look there as well. Um, but ultimately it can help us potentially better engage groups in innovation around agroforestry products. And so it's a little bit shifting from maybe where North American agroforestry has been focusing on an individual landowner um, and assisting them. And it's kind of expanding it out to say, how do we work with groups and actually moving these ideas forward? And so that's what I'm going to be, you know, developing, you know, this summer, finishing up my research plan and presenting it both to my committee and to the community to get input. And so that's, you know, those two things coming together. Um, but if there are any questions, I would love to take them. And uh, just knowing that it's not, compl all my research plan is not, not completely finished yet. But um, thank you very much for your time. Okay, so the question is if I will be considering uh, the kind of shifts in, that are, may be required of educational institutions in terms of working with communities versus an individual? Yeah, in order to facilitate more, um, more connections between agroforestry research and community development work. Okay, yeah, I won't be specifically um, studying, you know, educational institutions, but I think a lot of the work that I do will um, could inform, you know, the potential for more more of this type of research to go on. But there, I mean, I think possibly maybe writing something about uh, some of the some of the real challenges involved with this type of research too, and being honest about that, it is um, really hard to negotiate sometimes that um, community rooting, and then also really needing to provide something that a more general audience would like as well. And so I guess I can't necessarily speak to. Um, 
to my research being able to inform that, but just um, kind of from my experience, I know that it is kind of a challenge. So I guess if I would say if for educational institutions or researchers interested in doing this, it is, um, it's not, it's simple, but not easy. It is kind of the hard r route to go sometimes. And it's not really clear. And I think um, it's, it's critical to be, uh, I guess, comfortable, or I guess just accept the um, discomfort sometimes of not knowing certain things. Because ultimately, we're in the middle of uh, agri for agriculture and forestry. And then I'm also in the middle of biophysical research and social research. And now I'm like going towards the spectrum of participatory research. And so that really does add a number of levels. And it's not um, the best approach for every situation. Um, but I guess I would just say, you know, um, I, I think it's worth it. And that I guess going into it, you need to know um, kind of what to expect. I don't know if I answered that question, but OK. <laughs> Yep. Are you familiar with the work of the Regenerative Enterprise Institute about the eight forms of capital? Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Work? The um, sacred economics is that? No. I'll write that down because actually somebody had mentioned that to me, and I, I think it would be interesting to see how those two things overlap. So it's regenerative. Re regenerative. Enterprise Institute. Okay. Yeah. Those words are it's Steve, right? No. Okay, yeah, so Steve was just saying the Regenerative Enterprise Institute has kind of a, a model that may look like the seven forms of capital that I presented. So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, are there any other questions? Well, thanks so much for your time. Thank you.